Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Guelph Museum's Military Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Ken Irvin, and I'm the Education Coordinator at Guelph Museums. Our Military Lecture Series is in partnership with Laurier Center for Military and Strategic Disarmament Studies. Uh, tonight's talk by Heather Ellis will be about 45 minutes uh, in length, with time at the end uh, for Heather to answer some questions. If you do have any questions, please send them in through our chat function uh, on this web page and send it to everyone. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties, uh, please know that the session is being recorded and uh, will be made available on our social media platforms. Uh, you're welcome to simply listen tonight, or you can participate by uh, submitting questions uh, that will be answered at the end of the talk. And I'm, I will be monitoring the chat window throughout the evening. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that Guelph is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabeg peoples specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. Through the Between the Lakes Purchase Number no. 3 Treaty of 1792, the Mississaugas of the Credit ceded to the British Crown over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. We must do more to learn, share and support truth and healing. Uh, Guelph Museums continues to build our knowledge and relationships about the land, its history, and its people. This commitment informs all that we do at Guelph Museums. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, Heather Ellis uh, is a PhD candidate at Western University. Uh, she's under the supervision of Dr. Jonathan Vance, uh, and her dissertation focuses on the impact of war neuroses uh, had on veterans and their families, she is particularly interested in the ways in which veterans constructed their uh, mental illnesses and their negotiations with the Canadian state and disability applications. I'd like to thank Heather for joining us tonight, and I really look forward to hearing your talk tonight, Heather. Thank you, Ken, for that kind introduction, and thank you to everybody at Guelph Museums for putting this series together and getting it online. Um, so I'm going to share my PowerPoint presentation. And is that good? That's great with me. All right, perfect. Um, so two brief housekeeping notes. Uh, I have two cats who like to crash Zoom meetings, so they might make an appearance. Um, if you hear meows in the background, that is why. Um, I also want to acknowledge that due to the nature of the material, um, I study. There are some things in this presentation that people might find distressing. Um, so in particular for this presentation, I will allude to domestic violence, um, severe mental health symptoms, as well as institutionalization. Um, so just to keep that in mind as I'm going through the presentation. So shell-shocked veterans represent a small but significant sample of ex-servicemen whose disabilities were contested throughout the interwar period. By 1924, the Department of Soldiers Civil Reestablishment treated over 13,000 cases of neuropsychiatric disorders. Many of these men were hospitalized for brief periods at the end of the war, received small pensions, and tried to return to civilian life. Others returned to civilian life immediately after the war, but applied for pensions or treatment in the late 1920s and early 1930s. The invisible nature of their disability meant that it was hard to define their ailments and to prove that their symptoms impacted their everyday lives in a sustained and significant way. So the bulk of my research uses the Veterans Affairs Disability Pension Files that are held at Laurier. And these records offer historians a window into the lives of disabled veterans and their families. These files were originally created to, uh, to track the administrative and medical documents of disability pension applications. And I could write an entire presentation on the medical records in these documents, but this ignores the lived experiences of disabled veterans. So by exploring shell-shocked veterans and their families, we can move beyond these medical debates surrounding war neurosis. The files tell us information beyond a veteran's disability percentage. They, while they contain hospital and other medical records, they also contain social service reports, as well as letters from veterans, their families, and their employers. 
In these files, we can begin to understand the role that disability and mental illness played in the everyday lives of First World War veterans. These files are not perfect records, and during the microfilm process, some documents were removed because they were classified as non-essential. Some of the files run the entirety of the period that my work focuses on. However, others end abruptly in the 1920s or don't begin until the 1930s. Wherever possible, I have tried to find out what happened to these veterans outside of the pension files. Overall, these files offer an intimate view of veterans' lives in the post-war period. And because of this, I have changed all of the names in this presentation to protect their identity. Uh, this is in cooperation with an ethics approval that I obtained at Western and privacy agreements with Laurier. Men and their family members reported their most vulnerable thoughts and moments to pension officials and physicians. Individuals described dire financial circumstances, often begged for government assistance, and divulged things like addiction, violence, and destitution. The names of the doctors, administrative officials, and other individuals not related to a veteran's family have not been changed. So my presentation is going to focus on these four things. So the first um, topic I'm going to look at are the different diagnoses that I found in the files. Um, and in this section, I'll also briefly talk about um, the pensions and the pensions that they received. In the second section, I'm going to look at the symptoms that the veterans themselves described and how they framed their mental illness. And then the third section will explore three different life cycles um, that I see within the files and how that relates to having a mental illness in the post-war period. And then the last section, um, we'll look at institutionalization specifically. And I'm gonna look at one hospital in particular, and that's Westminster Hospital, uh, which is located in London, Ontario. It's now named Parkwood. It still looks after veterans, but it also looks after civilians as well. So although shell shock was and is a popular term to describe the psychological effects of war, veterans were diagnosed with a variety of mental illnesses. The most common diagnosis used by doctors was neurasthenia, which was a general nervous disorder characterized by headaches, fatigue, jumpiness, insomnia, and restlessness. Doctors viewed neurasthenia as an acquired disorder, therefore it was temporary and treatable. Veterans who exhibited symptoms like delusions and hallucinations were diagnosed with dementia praecox, which is an earlier diagnostic term for schizophrenia. Those who were diagnosed with dementia praecox are, were often hospitalized for the entirety of their lives. And although these individuals exhibited severe symptoms, pension officials were less likely to grant a pension for these illnesses. Doctors used family and medical records to discern if a mental illness was a war wound or a hereditary disease. If a veteran had a family member who was institutionalized, doctors were likely to attribute a veteran's mental illness to hereditary factors instead of their war experience. In between neurasthenia and dementia praecox were a variety of mental illnesses that shared symptoms with the two disorders. And this list shows a, a very brief list of the other um, diagnoses I found in the files. So ex-servicemen were diagnosed with melancholia, manic depressive, uh, neurosis, anxiety neurosis, shell shock, hysteria, function neurosis, and general paresis of the insane, which is the final stages of syphilis. Veterans with mental illness were also likely to have changing diagnoses throughout their life. Um, in the 149 veterans I have gone through thus far, 82 of them had a change in diagnosis, and 32 had their diagnoses changed more than once. So what types of pensions did these veterans receive? Um, Canadian disability pensions were divided into 5% increments, and that's explained in the top bar of the screen there. Um, so it goes from 100% to 5%. And then this was also differentiated depending on what rank you were. Um, so that's in the far left column there. And pensioners were granted additional allowances for their wives and children, which is explained in those two rows at the bottom. 
Pension officials viewed mental illness like neurasthenia as temporary disabilities and temporary pensions were on the lower end of the disability pension scale. So one final box for you. So if you look at um, the screen here in class 17, um, that's for 24% to 20% and a private would receive $120 a year um, for that pension. So one of the reasons why pensions were so low is that because physicians viewed this as a secondary gain. Um, doctors accused veterans of using pensions as a way to avoid their masculine obligations of employment and financial provider to the family. Dr. W. F. Day, who worked at Manitoba Military Hospital, strongly believed in the importance of employment and we can see this in the following two examples. Jay Hardy and E. Evans were both admitted to Manitoba Military Hospital in 1920 and suffered from nervous symptoms. Jay Hardy complained of nervousness, spells of weakness, insomnia, and Hardy was discharged by Day in February 1920. In his discharge notes, Day wrote, and quote, he is rather a drifting type. I don't think he ever had much energy or ambition. He should be at work recommended to the VPC that he should have no pension but a gratuity of $50, end quote. E. Evans was discharged by day in October 1920 after he recovered from his repressed memories of France. Evans wanted to return to his occupation as a railway brakeman, and although Day acknowledged he would not be able to return to his employment at full efficiency, he recommended a $250 gratuity instead of a pension. So if doctors and pension officials viewed neurosis as a temporary illness with minimal effect on veterans' health and livelihood, how did veterans view their mental illness? The veteran voice beyond well-documented cases is something that historians have struggled to find. However, we can use the pension files to uncover how veterans framed their mental illness. Because doctors and pension officials thought that psychological disabilities were temporary illnesses, they were required to report to medical examinations every six months. If a veteran refused a medical examination, his pension would be discontinued until he reported for treatment. These frequent medical examinations allow me to track the various symptoms veterans suffered from and understand how they constructed their illness as a war wound. So for example, W.F. Burns complained of feeling slightly nervous and having a slight tremor in his hands and tongue. And this enabled him, this caused him to have difficulty speaking in his medical boards. When he was treated at Spadina Hospital a few months later, he described having nerves while speaking, becoming easily excited and suffering from poor memory. Jay Brown told doctors at Spadina Hospital that he jumped in his sleep because he became easily excited, tired easily, and had lost 35 pounds. In a later letter to the pension board, he wrote, end quote, my nerves are in the same condition they were months ago. I am only able to work half time. Nerves are bad, end quote. When he reapplied for a pension in 1932, Brown complained of the same symptoms. From 1932 to 1935, Brown described his symptoms in greater detail to try and get his 10% pension for neurosis increased. He told Dr. Bailey at Christie Street Neurological Clinic that he was easily frightened at night, he hated arguing with others, he was afraid of the dark, and various noises on the street startled him. Brown also complained of fear dreams, but what these dreams contained is unclear. So these list the um, different symptoms that veterans described, and these are the most common ones. Um, but veterans usually talked about employment in addition to the symptoms that they experienced. And I would argue that employment is one of the most common ways veterans framed their mental illnesses to doctors during medical exams, as well as in their letter writing to pension officials. Um, so, unlike medical officials who viewed their disabilities in medical terms, veterans were more likely to view their disability in economic ones. Since veterans were unable to use the language that medical officials expected them to use, 
they often found their pension claims denied or diminished during medical examinations. A. Brooks, who worked in the garment industry, explained to the vocational officer in his 1918 training application that he could no longer operate the machines in the garment factory he worked in on account of the noise in the factory and the tremors in his hands. W. Barr, who worked as a chauffeur prior to the war, applied for vocational training in 1917 because he could no longer stand the rapid speed of the car. Other veterans' pensions illustrate the constant shift in employment. And see Kenton as, as an example of this. So he worked several jobs between 1923, and I'm going to list them off to you. Um, so Kent worked as a punch press operator in the shipping department, a mail order clerk, an elevator operator, a postal helper, a salesman, a hospital orderly, and a harvester. When he was exhausted from trying to find work, Kent finally reported to Deer Lodge Hospital in February 1927, complaining of nervousness. He was treated at the hospital for three months and was placed on an observation ward. At the end of his treatment, Kent was granted a 30% pension for neurasthenia in May of 1927. Kent was one of the few veterans granted a pension in the late 1920s. His various attempts at employment, coupled with his post-discharge hospitalization in 1919, convinced the pension board that his neurasthenia was a war service disability. Many veterans who linked their inability to find or maintain employment did not get sympathy from the pension board or physicians. So in my research, I've divided the life cycles of these men into three groups. The first are men who have applied for either training or pensions immediately after their discharge from the CEF. Um, they were either granted a, they were either granted training or a small pension, and when this is finished, uh, they do not apply for the pension board again, and their file ends. Um, so I see this often with younger men, who enlisted as minors. So, for example, W. Card, who enlisted at the age of 16 in 1915, um, complained of stammering speech and nervousness when he returned to Canada in 1918. Card served in France and was buried by a shell explosion on service. He also suffered from poor sleep and was tremulous at times. His stammering and tremors prevented him from returning to his occupation as a butcher. Card received a 15% pension for six months in 1919, and he was trained as an interior decorator. Um, he doesn't finish his training. Instead, he goes into a trucking um, occupation. And at the, when he decides to end his training abruptly, he's granted a $50 gratuity um, and he never applies for a disability pension. The second group are those who applied immediately post-discharge and continue to have a relationship with the pension board throughout the interwar period. This was either due to the severity of their symptoms, um, the need to be, to have constant medical examinations because they were granted pensions, um, or their constant attempts to gain a pension um, because they are consistently denied. A. Smith's file shows the cyclical nature of war neuroses and the difficult decisions that families made. Smith continued to have contact with pension officials and physicians throughout the 1920s. He was in and out of hospitals from his discharge in March 1919 until June 1923. His hospital records noted that Smith struggled with alcoholism and had terrifying dreams. While an outpatient, Smith returned to his job as a streetcar operator in Hamilton. In 1925, Dr. W.F. Nicholson visited Smith's home and noted that he was suffering from insomnia, loss of appetite, a loss of control of his emotions and feelings. He also noted that during the examination, Smith cried frequently without provocation. Smith told the doctor, and quote, he has done his best to keep on working and control himself, but that he is unable to do so on account of the numerous thoughts that keep coming into his mind. This keeps him from resting or sleeping, and he frequently feels that he must do something to himself, end quote. Dr. Nicholson recommended that Smith re-enter Christie Street Hospital for treatment, and Smith was readmitted in November 1925. Although Smith had severe symptoms and was hospitalized extensively, 
he was not in receipt of a pension. This meant that when he was admitted to hospital, his wife did not receive pay and allowances while he received treatment. It seems that alcohol was only an issue when Smith was at home and not while he was at work as well. Mrs. Smith admitted that her husband was physically and emotionally abusive to her and her children, and families had to make difficult financial decisions in the face of physical and emotional violence. It's not clear from the pension files that Mrs. Smith worked. Their eldest son at this time is, is in his teens, so I'm assuming that he probably contributed to the family economy. But what this case shows is that families were willing to lose wages in the hopes that ex-servicemen could be treated and returned to the workforce once their hospitalization was over. Smith was released from Christie Street Hospital in 1926 and returned to his job as a streetcar operator. He worked well in his position and was liked by his employers, but he tired easily and frequently felt nervous while on the job. He continued to drink to excess and was admitted to Christie Street several times in the late 1920s for alcoholism. His file demonstrates that some veterans were caught in a cycle that comprised of brief periods of work and hospitalization. After his arrest and imprisonment at a jail farm, Smith ceased to use alcohol for a few years, but he was still hospitalized regularly for extreme emotional outbursts, insomnia, and dreams. And so the third and final group of veterans that I'm going to talk about um, are men who either renewed pension applications in the 1930s um, or those who didn't apply for assistance in the 1930s. And these 1930s applications happened for a number of reasons. The first and perhaps most obvious is that the Great Depression made unemployment a reality for many Canadians, regardless of their disability. Um, veterans were also aging rapidly. So men who were in their 40s, 50s, and 60s um, found themselves run down from a war that they had fought in their youth. Lastly, there was a change in pension bureaucracy. Um, so in 1930, veterans who had chosen to commute their pensions in 1920 were now allowed to reapply for a pension. And 1933 pension legislation allowed any veteran to apply for a pension for the first time. C. Larson is an example of veterans who received assistance immediately after the war and then applied during the 1930s. These veterans were hit with long-term disability and the economic issues brought on by the Great Depression. Larson was granted a commercial course in shorthand and typewriting at Toronto Central Technical School. He was unable to finish his course and had to restart it in April of 1919. After he finished his training course, his own personal connections got him a position as secretary for the superintendent of Toronto's Harbour Commission, but the slightest mental strain or worry set him right back. He and his wife decided to move them and their small son to California in 1920 to try and alleviate his symptoms. Larson worked as a dry goods salesman until 1931 when his nervousness forced him to quit. After he left his job and moved his family to a three acre ranch, after he left his job, he moved his family to a three acre ranch where he raised chickens and rabbits. Larson succeeded at the farm until January 1933, where he, when he could no longer take care of the farm and the family moved to Venice Beach. And Larson began applying for a pension in 1933. So the BPC reviews Larson's file uh, to determine if he is eligible for a pension. Uh, when they review his file, they discover in his service history that he was a prisoner of war in Germany from April 1915 to August 1915, and he spent most of his time as a prisoner at a German hospital. Since Larson had documented nervous symptoms soon after his discharge in 1916, the BPC granted a 25 disability pension for neurasthenia. Interestingly, Larson is also blind, was also blind in his right eye, but he never receives a pension for blindness. His pension was back paid six months from his request. And Larson's case highlights that veterans attempted to work until they were no longer able to provide for their families. His case also demonstrates the lengths that veterans went to try and alleviate their symptoms. 
The Larsons had no family in California and don't seem to have made any connections to support them. They were forced to rely on themselves and the pension authorities. Larson's file also highlights the importance of wives as pillars of support and informants for pension officials. Most men were unlikely to disclose the toll that mental illness took upon themselves at the family unit. Instead, it was their wives who, in their letters and investigative interviews, divulged the impact war neuroses had on their families. Letters often contained more detailed descriptions of their husband's symptoms and dire finances. Many wives tried to keep their husbands at home and took on several responsibilities. Uh, so Mrs. Larson, for example, managed an apartment building when they moved to Venice Beach when her husband could no longer work. Her husband helped her with odd jobs around the apartment buildings, but it was clear that Mrs. Larson was the made wage earner for the household. The conversations within the pension files demonstrate that family members were also important pillars of support for veterans. Larson's wife wrote several passionate letters to the department that documented her husband's symptoms and their experiences in California. She closed one letter requesting that the authorities did not tell her husband about her letter writing, as it would be against his express wishes and desires. Her husband did not want the authorities to think that he is lying to cash in on the fact that he went overseas. She closed, I would gladly work my fingers to the bone to see, to see my husband only smile again. He is a good, patient, and wonderful man, but right now I fear the result when he really knows he is through. Not all veterans had wives that were willing or could even support them. And that begs the question of what happened to men who never married at all. C. Jackson completely rejected the world around him and worked as a park ranger in the Athabasca region for his entire life. He seemed to enjoy this work and canoed hundreds of miles every day. Although he admitted the work was exhausting, Jackson's nervous symptoms decreased when he decided to work as a park ranger. He never married and told Dr. Hepburn that he often went two weeks without speaking to anyone. The physicians in Edmonton were the only individuals Jackson really interacted with. The largest percentage of single men that I've examined thus far are servicemen who were institutionalized um, in hospitals, and that's who I'm going to talk about next. Um, so I've chosen to separate them because um, institutionalized veterans versus non-institutionalized veterans, um, because how their files are arranged is quite different. Um, and their lives are also very different as well. So instead of interacting with pension officials and a variety of different doctors, those who lived in um, Westminster Hospital, for example, interacted with doctors, a single doctor there for their entire life. Um, the patient voice is also very difficult to unearth from these types of pension files. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because Westminster in the 1920s was very bad at paperwork. Um, looking at the different medical records that are put into the pension files, um, Westminster's are the most general. They are often the ones that also don't track symptoms as frequently as other hospitals do. And this doesn't um, get rectified until 1920. 33, um, when a patient died on a ward um, due to another patient. So Westminster Hospital was one of several hospitals built by the DSCR uh, from 1917 to 1920. And though, although all hospitals treated veterans with neuropsychiatric illnesses, um, Westminster was one of two specific institutions built for this purpose. Um, the other institution was St. Anne de Bellevue in Quebec and they were created due to public outcry that veterans were being placed in civilian asylums instead of private institutions. Articles in several newspapers, like the one in the Globe here, belied the government for placing veterans indiscriminately in the midst of incurables and violently insane patients in provincial asylums. Westminster received its first patients in April 1920, and after two years of remodeling and a bill of over $2 million, uh, it opened 
By the end of 1920, Westminster had a patient population of 363 veterans. And this number stays relatively stable throughout the interwar period. Um, eventually it expands so it can hold 500 veterans. So Westminster was built in a similar style to previous psychiatric institutions. They had large grounds that could be used for agriculture and outdoor patient labor. Continuous baths and occupational therapy were the cornerstones of treatment at each hospital. This was a continuation of moral treatment therapy um, that was prominent in the late 19th and early 20th century. It's also called rest cure. Work as therapy was supposed to distract the patient from their condition and help regulate their mind. Occupational work also had the added benefit of reducing costs around the hospital. And this practice was taken from civilian institutions. Veterans who were diagnosed with severe mental disorders were treated at Westminster. And this chart um, breaks down the different diagnoses. So this is from 1924. Um, and as you can see on the screen, the largest patient population are those that are diagnosed with dementia praecox. Patients were admitted to Westminster either through voluntary admission or they were committed. In order to further separate veteran institutions from civilian ones, the DSCR encouraged veterans to admit themselves voluntarily and many veterans seemed willing to do so. So as this slide shows, um, the admission rate for Westminster remained high throughout the interwar period. Uh, 1920 is reversed because during this time, patients who were at uh, Coburg Military Hospital or Newmarket um, were transferred to Westminster and those were usually committal patients. So from these numbers, we can surmise that veterans wanted to be treated at Westminster or at least willing to do so if there is a chance of a pension being granted. It's difficult to tell from the pension files what veterans were admitted on a committal basis. Those who were admitted to the hospital either for treatment or a pension assessment, I have deduced they admitted themselves voluntarily. The committal papers that were supposed to be used for committed veterans rarely appear in the pension files. When a veteran was moved from a jail cell to a DSCR institution, I've assumed that they were committed to the hospital, especially when doctors at Westminster refused to discharge them. Some veterans were admitted after family members intervened. Um, so for example, F. Gibson, who did not apply for a pension during his discharge because he was anxious for to return home and purchased a farm. In 1921, he began to exhibit several worrying symptoms to his father and his young wife. However, they believed that once Gibson had rested, he would improve and they wouldn't have to send him to a hospital. In August 1921, Gibson's symptoms reach a climax when he rented a flashy car, crashed it, abandoned his wife and two young children on the side of the road for several days. The local community became involved and helped Gibson's wife and he was admitted to Hamilton Asylum first. Gibson was transferred to Westminster Hospital in April 1922 when the department determined that his syphilis was due to service. It's unclear from Gibson's file if he tried to resist his hospitalization in Hamilton or at Westminster. He was a quiet patient on the ward and his condition deteriorated rapidly. By February 1924, Gibson was a bed patient on the ward and he suffered from several seizures and he died in September 1924 from his condition. However, I have unearthed that not all veterans were happy with their treatment at Westminster Hospital, and this is especially true if they were committed against their will. Uh, w. Fisher is an example of one such veteran. Um, so he was admitted to Westminster Hospital in April of 1920 after he was arrested in Port Arthur um, during, after a scuffle that he had with some other men. Fisher had denounced the empire openly. This is one of the reasons that was given for his arrest. And he frequently requested his release. Fisher escaped Westminster three times. The first time in February, 1923, he remained outside the institution until January, 1924, when Buffalo authorities contacted the DSCR. When Fisher returned to Westminster, he began a letter writing campaign. In a letter written in July 1925, 
Fisher wrote to the Honorable Dr. Belland. I have requested Dr. McGee and Dr. McLean for my civilian clothes and boots. Much gentleness would not give. So I have requested transfer to Ontario Asylum, London. Refused. I have requested Dr. McGee, who is in charge of this institution for deportation to Ireland. For that purposes, I got $210.16 to pay expenses. The man in charge refused. Now I put it before you for your attention. I wish for release or for deportation to Ireland. And perhaps the most telling phrase in the letter was Fisher's uh, signatory at the bottom, and he signed it, your prisoner. Fisher's pension file is one of the few files that contain veterans letters from inside the institution. Individuals in civilian institutions regularly had their mail checked and blocked by hospital administrators. The issue at Westminster was that men admitted themselves voluntarily. They could not have their mail blocked simply because they were labeled insane. Because Fisher was committed to the asylum, his letters could be checked and potentially blocked if the department chose to do so. So after this letter writing campaign, um, Fisher gets tired of writing letters and decides to take more drastic measures and he escapes Westminster twice more. The second time he makes it as far as Quebec City where he's stopped by immigration authorities. Um, instead of being transferred back to Westminster, they put him in St. Anne de Bellevue and he escapes from St. Anne's in October of 1934 and makes it back to Port Arthur where his sister lived. Um, at this time, his sister intervenes with the pension authorities and claims that he wasn't showing any sign of violence at the time. Dr. JPS Cathcart, who is the chief psychiatrist at the time for the DSCR, decided to leave him with his sister. And in April 1935, Fisher finally goes back to Ireland after his brother pays for his passage. Um, how Fisher found Ireland is unknown because his file ends shortly after. So institutionalization not only impacted the lives of veterans, but their families as well. Gibson's wife, who I mentioned earlier, moved to London when he was committed to Westminster Hospital and lived in a small house near the hospital. And as I mentioned earlier, very few veterans at Westminster were married. However, they did have a specific group of dependents that relied on their financial income, which was their parents. Some parents faced difficult economic circumstances when their sons were institutionalized. Jay Banks' mother spent most of the 1920s and 1930s trying to convince department officials that she required financial assistance from the government. The issue was that unlike wives, parents did not receive hospital allowances as a matter of right. They had to prove that their son would have provided for their care if they were not a patient. Parents were also required to prove that they did not have other children who could assist them financially. Mrs. Banks had three other living sons, and the department social service worker argued that these sons were responsible for her care. So within the hospital, institutionalized veterans were separated according to the severity of their diseases and symptoms. And this dictated how much access they had to other wards in the hospital, the outdoor grounds, recreation facilities, and the city of London. Patients who were placed on locked wards were supervised for most of their lives and had their movements restricted to their wards. The most severe patients, like Jay Banks, were restrained in their beds using packs and fasteners so they could not harm themselves, other patients, or staff. Orderlies sometimes took these patients to recreation facilities or in outdoor walks, and these were usually heavily supervised. Patients who were on parole wards were granted greater freedom around the hospital and could attend various workshops and entertainments offered by the hospital. For example, Pete Andrew enjoyed reading magazines and smoking cigarettes on the sun porch. Westminster's patients also had active sports leagues that played in cricket and baseball and lawn bowling leagues with London's residents. Um, and this poster shows a field day that Westminster held that Londoners attended to see veterans and the medical officials at the hospital participate in. Um, other patients learned instruments. So for example, one patient and their personal effects after they died, they had a flute um, and the file details how he learned how to play the flute in the hospital. 
another patient learned how to play the trombone. Parole patients were also allowed to go into town on day or weekend passes unsupervised. And for example, in 1930, Westminster granted dozens of patients leave over Christmas holidays so they could be with their families. Hospital administrators encouraged veterans to, be, to become part of the hospital's community and economy, and they rewarded those who were positive members of the hospital. And to close, I want to describe the life of one particular patient um, who I've named Jay Greenwood. Jay Greenwood served in France from March 1917 until the armistice, and medical authorities first noticed his symptoms at the end of November 1917. He was treated in several hospitals overseas before he was invalided to Canada. When he was invalided to Canada in May 1919, he was admitted to Coburg Military Hospital. Greenwood was one of the first patients admitted to Westminster and was diagnosed with dementia praecox. Greenwood had several specific delusions that followed him throughout his life. The most major one was that he believed a metal piece he picked up in France was affecting him, and he thought that he could read um, certain passages of the Bible through this metal piece. In July 1922, he was released on probation after he had several good reports at the hospital. And patients who showed improvement were often trialed on three month outpatient periods. His family had also requested this leave. Um, although his father had two sons at home, he required extra help on their farm. He was granted leave to Simcoe County for two weeks, and this leave was extended after his father's good reports on his behavior. However, Greenwood returned to Westminster in September of 1922 after he attacked his father. The Greenwoods also had a daughter with severe disabilities, and they could not take care of two family members or have a violent family member in the home when the other was vulnerable, and Greenwood was never granted probation again. The rest of Greenwood's life in Westminster is documented through bi-yearly medical reports. In spring of 1925, Dr. Horn reported uh, Greenwood was a productive member of the ward and the broader hospital structure. Greenwood took a keen interest in watch repairing at Westminster. Where he learned this skill is unclear because it's not mentioned until this date. He was a farmer prior to the war, and I'm assuming he learned this in he learned watchmaking in one of the vocational classes offered at Westminster. He repaired washes, watches for patients and doctors at Westminster and was allowed le to leave the hospital, although accompanied by an orderly, to purchase his materials for his watch repairing. Greenwood's interest in watchmaking made him a complicated patient for doctors at the hospital. Although they praised his industrial nature and allowed him to keep his tools with him on the ward, purchase new materials, and even paid him for his work, Greenwood was, was prone to violent outbursts on the ward. In 1945, after weeks of verbal taunting, he attacked another patient. The patient's right eye was covered in contusions and he had a deep cheek laceration. Uh, Greenwood was removed to a different ward, but after a few months he was transferred back. But during this time, none of his watchmaking privileges are taken away from him. He's still allowed to keep his tools, he still repairs watches for doctors. So there's this very interesting interplay happening. In his old age, Greenwood stopped repairing watches and took up gardening. The hospital administrators gave him and other veterans a plot on the hospital grounds. Um, and during the Second World War, Westminster had expanded its emphasis on outdoor rehabilitation and recreation. So if you're from London, um, you can actually go on a walk where this photo is taken. Most of the buildings, um, the three that are on the left are destroyed. You can just see the foundation, but the main building in the center is still there. And so this focus on outdoor rehabilitation um, reinforced earlier post-war ideas that the natural environment was a positive influence in the lives of psychiatric patients. And this was also extended to the physically disabled. Greenwood continued to cultivate his beloved plot of land until October 7th, 1949, when he suddenly collapsed in his garden and died from a heart attack. Um, his life highlights that veterans created meaningful lives within the institution, and his personal effects when he died reflect this at well, as well. So this is a list of all of the items that Greenwood had. Um, this is one of the longer lists that I've seen, 
So as you can see, there are several watches in his possession. Um, he also has a reel and a grip for fishing, and it also seems that he was able to repair leather tools as well. So to close, shell-shocked veterans and their families lived complex lives in post-war Canada. The cyclical nature of disability and mental illness continued to impact veterans and their families at different points in their lives. Veterans viewed disability in terms of employment and highlighted how their symptoms impacted their ability to keep jobs. Many veterans returned to the pension board in the late 1920s and 1930s for assistance. Families were impacted by the constant financial strain these disabilities caused, and wives often bore the brunt emotionally and physically. They were caretakers, breadwinners, child carers, and advocates for their husbands. Veterans who were institutionalized for the majority of their lives are perhaps the hardest to understand. These cases have demonstrated the ways in which ex-servicemen resisted institutionalization and the potential impact that institutionalization had on their families. In the case of Greenwood, it appears that some veterans were able to live fulfilling lives within the walls of the institution, but they had to appear as productive members of the broader hospital community. Much remains to be done in the examination of veteran mental health presently and historically. Shell-shocked veterans are notoriously hard to find in the archival record, and those that are, off that are discovered are often the exception to the rule. To understand the average lives of veterans, we must learn to read historical documents in new ways and move beyond debates about diagnosis and symptoms to truly understand the lived experience of these ex-servicemen. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Heather, for a really fascinating talk and uh, an amazing amount of research. I'm sure that the records you've went through are fascinating to, to dig into. Yeah, um, I still have more to go. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, I do have a question about the records. Um, uh, someone asked, is it possible for family members to see an individual's file? Probably. Um, I would contact Matt Baker at the Laurier Center for Military Strategic Disarmament Studies. Um, and yeah, you, you, you have to sign um, like an agreement, but you should be able to look at the files. Okay. And and if you anyone wants to do that, Matt is on their website, so you can just contact Matt Matt through the the Laurier Military Center website. Yes, uh, easy enough. Um, another question, um, one from a a PhD student uh, in the history department at York University. Um, he's studying um, shell shock from the British point of view, and his question is: Did Canada execute shell shock soldiers for cowardice and desertion? And did Canada have any greater sympathy? or a shell shock than the British counterparts? Um, so Canada doesn't execute as many um, soldiers as England did. One of the reasons is we had a much smaller um, expeditionary force. I actually have several veterans in my sample who were um, scheduled to be executed for cowardice. Um, but their execution has stayed and they moved back to Canada and um, they remain in a hospital for the rest of their lives. Um, I don't know if I would say if Canada is more sympathetic. In the instances that I'm finding, they are where they are um, scheduled for an execution and then it stayed. Uh, I know that all of Canada's court martial records are now online. Um, through Canadiana. So if you want to look at that, that could also help you out. But from what I have seen so far, I think I have about four or five. Um, they're either uh, um, served 10 years imprisonment or two of them were scheduled to be executed, but they're waived. Okay. Thank you. Um, when did the Canadian government first recognize um, shell shock vic victims and recognize that they needed they needed special treatment. Um, I would say that probably starts in 1917 with the creation of it's called the Military Hospitals Commission. Um, so the government institution that I talked about um, was the Department of Soldier Civil Reestablishment, and the Military Hospital Commission is its um, predecessor. And they start to build and gather different conf 
convalescent homes and hospitals for different veterans. Um, the in, in, in the instance of shell shock, um, this isn't until later in the war, so probably like 1917, 1918, but the department doesn't start to build hospitals um, from the hospital records that I've seen or like decide that they're going to do this until 1918. Um, when the war has ended, uh, Westminster and St. Anne's are both built because um, they're actually renovation projects. So the government believed that they needed to build more convalescent hospitals for these soldiers. Um, but then with the end of the war in November 1918, the foundation um, for London's military hospital, that's what it was originally called, um, was built and they sort of have to decide what to do with it. So there's this debate whether it's going to be a tuberculosis sanatoria or a um, psychiatric hospital. Um, they decide for various reasons that it's not suited for a tuberculosis hospital and they start to build it as a psychiatric hospital. Okay, um, next question. Um, you said that a veteran could be cut off if he refused a medical examination or treatment. Was this a two-step process example? Um, you could go for an exam and then decide whether to be treated or did going for the exam constitute a de facto acceptance of the treatment regime suggested? Um, so if you, for example, had a pension um, and then six months, the pension official would tell you, okay, in six months you have to report for an examination. Um, if you didn't report for that examination, the uh, the pension would be discontinued. If in that examination they recommended that you enter treatment for, let's say, two months um, to be observed to see if your uh, illness was as severe as the veteran was claiming, and they refused that, that was seen as the same as refusing a medical exam, and it could be discontinued then as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I did add another question about pension amounts. Um, it says the pension amount seems quite low in the chart you showed at the beginning of your presentation. Um, any idea of what the range of pension amounts would be in today's currency? I do not know. Yeah, that is math. That's... That is not <laughs> that I could not. I could not do now. Um, it's very low. They also don't really increase as well. So like with, it doesn't go increase with inflation from okay. my understanding either. Um, they do increase after, during the second world war. Um, but before then there isn't much increases from that. Um, well, another question about pensions. Um, did anyone ever get a hundred percent pension for shell shock or neurasthenia? There were some cases. Um, often those who had 100%, they um, either had another disability. So one of the things they didn't address is that some of these veterans didn't just have um, psychiatric illnesses. They also had um, loss of a right arm or they had tuberculosis or they had um, blindness in their eyes or they, they were blind. Um, so when they had a physical disability as well as a psychiatric disability, they're more likely to have a higher pension percentage. Okay. Um, the issue with that is, is that the department then has to decide which is the dominant disability. So let's say you're 50% disabled um, because you lost your left leg, which is very rare. This, this is a small group. Um, they could then decide from that 50%, 15% of that 50% was, relate, of, was related to your neurasthenia and do it that way. Um, there were some who had uh, dementia precox or shell shock um, that received 100%. It is very rare. Um, some of them who were institutionalized received 100% pensions, but they never um, get that money because they are hospitalized. So they get paying allowances through the department, but those pensions, when they die, um, they just go back into the department 
fund. Okay. Um, and one more question. This will be our last question. Um, it says, um, you mentioned that sports were organized for the patients. Are there other ways that group activities among the patients were encouraged as part of their treatment? Yeah, so sports is definitely one of them. Um, agricultural work was also important. And I'm pretty sure they had a band from what I can understand of all of the different veterans that are playing these different instruments. I'm pretty sure they had an organized band that played um, either at weekly dances or they hired bands to play at weekly dances and like locals were encouraged to come um, participate. And they also held um, movie nights for them and they had theme nights, I believe as well. Uh, so they had a bunch of different sort of activities to entertain them that way. Great. Well, I wanna thank you again, Heather, for a fantastic presentation and answering all those questions. Um, and I just want to mention that uh, next month, uh, our, we have our lecture, another military lecture on April 22nd uh, at 7 o'clock. And it's by Paul Mansell. And his talk is titled The Great Sickness of 1740, uh, War, Typhus, and the Royal Navy. So it will tie in a little bit to pandemics and typhus and uh, disease. So I think it'll be a really fascinating talk. Um, and I just want to also let everyone know that uh, the museum is open to the public. Uh, we have a regular hours from 10 to 5. Uh, we do have uh, limited attendance, so I suggest that you do book ahead uh, online uh, if you are coming. And I also wanted to point out that um, our curatorial staff have been really busy in, in the last little while. We have three new exhibits to check out. Uh, on the first floor, uh, we have a, an exhibit uh, by um, on the CFRU, uh, radio from the, uh, the university, 40 years on the FM dial, celebrating 40 years of broadcasting and the voices of Guelph's campus and community. Uh, another university exhibit, um, it's from farmland irrigation to Martian explore, exploration, uh, 125 years of physics in Guelph. And uh, on our third floor, you can see uh, a gallery ex ex exhibition on a uh, memory cycle, resonified artifacts. And this exhibition is a foray into the parlor rooms of Victorian Guelph uh, and an experiment with Victorian era piano recordings. So you can also find out more about our exhibits on our website too. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight and uh, hopefully we see you again next month.